Postscript Media, podcast for a changing planet. Tamar, you told me a shocking fact about yourself. You are not a chocoholic. I know. And, and, you know, I used to like chocolate more when I was younger, but as I've gotten older, I've sort of lost my taste for it. And I knew I was in trouble when a friend of mine offered to make me a birthday cake and I didn't want chocolate. I wanted almond, mango, coconut. I mean, that that is not just un-American. That is like inhuman. Like, aren't we, aren't we hardwired to just crave chocolate? Doesn't it set off our endorphins or our serotonin or whatever that is? <laughs> I kind of thought we were, but then, I don't know, maybe this is further proof that I'm a space alien. <laughs> I, I think it, it may be because uh, I will tell you, I love chocolate in any form, the fancy chocolate, the cheap chocolate, the white chocolate, the dark chocolate. I am equal opportunity with chocolate. Um, and it turns out that I think a lot of people are. I was amazed to see that the world eats 8 million tons of chocolate every year. And in fact, the average American eats like 12 pounds a year. That is that is a lot of chocolate. And obviously it's... Uh, it's not very good for us, but it turns out it's not all that great for the climate either. It's like a double helping of helping of guilt that we're uh, we're shoveling onto our our listeners. It's like we're we're out to ruin everything they enjoy. And we brought a guest to do just that. And Rowan Jacobson is uh, one of my favorite journalists out there, actually. And our paths crossed when he wrote The Essential Oyster, an excellent book about oysters. And uh, and we've talked about oysters off and on over the past few years. But then he wrote this book called Truffle Hound, which I just loved. It's about hunting truffles in Italy and breeding the dogs to do it. And it's a great read and a fun book, and you learn a lot along the way. I swear, he picks his topics just so he can travel to exotic locations. And now he's, he's, he's written about chocolate for a long time, but his latest project is Obsessions, Wild Chocolate, a, a podcast with, I think, six episodes about something I didn't even know existed, um, which is wild chocolate. So we're going to have Rowan help us bust everybody's bubble about chocolate and climate. Obsessions definitely sounds like a good name for a show about chocolate. But of course, we're going to do the dorky side because that's what we do. I'm Michael Grunwald. And I'm Tamar Haspel. And this is Climavores, a show about eating chocolate on a changing planet. COVID, reproductive rights, staggering medical debt. Health policy is in the news like never before. Hi, I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent at Kaiser Health News and host of the podcast KHN's What the Health. Every week, top reporters from outlets including The New York Times, Politico, and CNN join me to discuss the latest health and health policy news. Confused by all the health policy jargon? We'll break it down in terms that are easy to understand. KHN's What the Health. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Rowan, thanks so much for being with us today to talk about chocolate and climate and chocolate. <laughs> We're delighted to have you. Uh, thanks for having me, even though you hate chocolate. <laughs> I don't hate it. Come on. <laughs> but, but okay, so I think that chocolate is, even though people love it so much and Mike likes it almost as much as he likes beef and green bananas, is a little bit of a black box for people. So before we get into the climate impact, can you just do a brief rundown on what cacao is and how it becomes chocolate? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm totally uh, psyched that you asked that because as you said, most people really don't have any idea uh, what it is or where it's coming from. Um, so I'll try to, I'll try to keep it short, but um, cacao is, it's a fruit. Uh, people don't even realize that. It's the seeds of a fruit that grows in the tropics. So the cacao tree is this, you know, mid-sized tree and it has these pods all over it that look 
kind of like Nerf footballs, actually, um, or like a delicata squash. Like they're, they're those colors, and you open them up, and they have seeds inside with this sticky pulp, the sugary pulp all over them. Um, and to make chocolate, you have to take the seeds that are in there and ferment them and dry them. Uh, then you grind them up into a paste, and that's what chocolate is. And so that paste then is the cocoa that we're familiar with. Exactly, like 100% like baking chocolate. And then to become chocolate, you mix the cocoa powder with the um, the cocoa butter, which is the other component. Well, cocoa butter is in there already, and actually, and we can get into this later. Um, but we have one of the um, that's kind of like cacao's superpower is that it's fifty percent fat. Uh, the beans are, and fifty percent really good fat. Cocoa butter is like one of the most prized fats out there. Um, both for culinary stuff and for uh, like skin care. Um, but it's got, it's amazing um, power is that it is solid at room temperature, but liquid at body temperature. So that's why chocolate has this incredible plastic uh, quality that you can change, melt it and remelt it and that you can have it be solid, but as soon as it goes in your mouth. So Mike's salivating now. <laughs> Well, well, Roan, we're we're so thrilled to have you with us. Um, but so yeah, let's let's get into a little bit of the nerdy climate stuff because you know Tamar and I have trained ourselves to believe that tree crops are awesome for the climate, right? Because they store a lot of you know they they store a lot of carbon, and you can see it above ground. Um, often they have very high yields, um, but. If you look at these charts where, you know, using a lot of Tamar's favorite uh, metrics, <laughs> um, chocolate doesn't do so well. It, in fact, it does really badly. Um, it's up there with lamb, right? Not quite as bad as beef, which uh, we all know is the worst, but it's even worse than dairy. And of course, you know, way worse than nuts and fruits and other things that, that you generally find in trees. Let's clarify that for one second. That's in terms of just greenhouse gas emitted per kilogram of product. And of course, you don't eat a half a pound of chocolate. That, well, unless you're- Well, speak like, for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> unless you're American. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that that it's it's important to talk about that impact and where it comes from. Yeah, and it's it's funny because yeah, it should be in theory it should be like other tree crops, um, a, a big winner. Like right. Um, and the fact that it's not is has like you know unfortunate historical, um, you know, just like blips. Tell us about that. Because I think it's you know it's 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 really intertwined with the the data points that we're left with. Yeah, exactly. So the, I guess it's Achilles' heel, you might say, is that it is native to the Amazon. It's it's a tree that grows in the rainforest. So if you're going to grow a bunch of cacao, you have to grow it in the places on the planet where you would otherwise find rainforest. So um, it it was born in the Amazon and. Uh, ancient peoples in the Americas figured out how to take these seeds and turn them into chocolate, and it was um, a core component of their culture. Uh, then Europeans got a hold of it, turned it into a big industrial product, and took this tree that normally grows uh, scattered throughout the rainforest in small numbers and grew it in plantation style in these monocrops. They bred varieties of it that were adapted to the sun instead of the shade that it was normally in. and um, started clearing rainforests uh, all across the globe, actually, uh, to, to grow cacao. And so that's really, um, that's where it has managed to cause so much trouble is that uh, it displaces rainforest. And so that's not the only shortcoming of chocolate because there are other things that aren't climate-related but maybe labor-related Um so chocolate has made lots of headlines over the last couple of decades, and not all of them are good. What are some of the other issues that you've come across in the last couple of decades? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the poster child for bad labor practices. <laughs> um, again, it's because it's it's growing in these tropical areas, um, which tend to be very poor areas. And um, so what's happened is that it's all being grown by almost subsistence farmers. Like, smallholders who maybe have just a few acres and are being paid very low prices um, because it's a commodity like, uh, you know, like maize or oil. Um, so uh, the the market drives the price and the price is super low um, because 
you can pay these people in mostly in Africa um, all, next to nothing to produce cacao. And um, what that means is that they're going to figure out a way to do it because they have no choice. And that means using their whole family to do it and sometimes using children from neighboring places who are fleeing usually like civil wars and stuff. Uh, so you get the situation where a lot of the people growing cacao are underage and aren't being paid anything. They might just be getting food and shelter, and that still might actually be an improvement for them compared to their other options. Um, but it's just a big mess. And the the huge corporations that dominate the chocolate business have um, perhaps understandably distanced themselves, however possible, from that situation um, and have meanwhile pledged for 20 years now to try to fix it and haven't managed to do that. Now, doesn't – so full disclosure, my husband spent 30 years as a commodity trader, and at one point, you know, he was a member on the New York Board of Trade, which used to be coffee, sugar, cocoa. Right, and, exactly, um, yeah. So most of the cocoa that comes into this country used to, and I believe still does, come in through the commodity markets. And how can these big companies that produce this – uh, that produce most of the chocolate we eat, differentiate their cocoa when it's coming through commodity markets. And that's the crux of it right there. It, like Traditionally, they can't. Like, cacao is, is bought and sold 100,000 tons at a time mm -hmm. on these commodities exchanges, even though it's being produced by you know, solo farmers who only have a few acres – um, there are millions of those farmers, and so you have this river of cocoa beans that makes its way to the coasts of Africa, and Africa produces about 70% of the world's uh, cacao, um, and then make, you know, fill f tankers and freighters and get shipped to warehouses in Amsterdam and, you know, other big port cities uh, that trade in commodities where they just sit in these warehouses until they're bought and sold, um, and so that, as that, all the little tributaries of that river come together, there's no way to go back the other way and figure out where these beans originated. Um, so even if these companies wanted to be able to, you know, to have a transparent supply chain, they, right now they can't. Um, they, but, but should they have been working more to try to change that? Uh, yes. I think everyone's in agreement that they, they could have tried harder. They really didn't have a whole lot of incentive. Like everyone's always threatening to boycott Hershey's and there have been boycotts against Hershey's and Mars and a lot of the big companies. Um, and they've made tiny bits of progress, but it's still pretty much the same where there are <laughs> like uh, one of these experts I was talking to told me there are, that there can be easily 12 to 14 middlemen uh, in between the farmer and the consumer buying the chocolate bar. So like, so how can you trace under those circumstances? Yeah, and no one's been able to, to figure that one out. That's really, I mean, uh, you know, certainly I'm, I know in, in our pantry, we have some of those, you know, the kind of like, what is it, fair trade, organic, basically like, you know, goody two-shoes chocolate that comes in the kind of like weird green construction paper <laughs> type of wrapper. I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and just kind of screams like, this is good. But uh, it's funny because Tamar and I, again, we've, we've, we're familiar with deforestation commodities, right? Yeah. We've, we've talked about palm oil and soy and beef. And usually, you know, if you want to make it less of a problem, you want to, you know, kind of increase the yield, right? And apparently, I guess, cacao has quite low yield. So maybe there are ways to increase those yields. Or you want to store more carbon in the land you're using, which, you know, maybe there's some way to do that with cacao trees, or at least not to expand into deforested land by reusing existing cacao plantations. Um, or, you know, if you're not going to do that, you kind of have to reduce demand. And I think everybody agrees we're probably not going <laughs> to reduce demand for chocolate. When you think about, like, how to make chocolate better as a commodity, you know, what are, what are some of the ways that, that, that people can do it? Europe is talking about, you know, these laws that are going to require things to be deforestation free. How could you do that for cacao in a way that would actually you know, help the climate and maybe also help some of these exploited workers. Yeah, and that's going to cacao is going to be a really interesting test. Like that's one of like the big six that Europe was looking at when they passed that new law. Yeah. Um, but like 
I mean, and I'm not, I'm no expert on that new law, but my understanding is it covers deforestation since 2020, I think. Um, um, and that could be a problem with cacao because um, what happened with cacao is um, Ivory Coast and Ghana are the two big players. They dominate. And it's really bad. Ivory Coast has lost 85% of their rainforest, mostly because of cacao. Right. They have no elephants now, right? They used to be the Ivory Coast. Right? Elephants are, exactly. The ivory's gone. The ivory might still be there, but the rest of the elephants are gone. But what? It, there's literally millions of displaced people um, because they've had two civil wars. All the areas around them have had civil wars. Governments are very unstable. So they had millions of displaced people living in the forest preserves there and like trying to like survive. So the easiest way you can survive there in that situation is to plant a few uh, cocoa beans and have some, have a few cocoa trees, cacao trees, and then you get, you know, an infinitesimal amount of income, but it's kind of the only option that a lot of these people had. So um, something like 40% of Ivory Coast cacao was actually coming from reserved forests, which were no longer forests. Um, but it was all illegal, but the government couldn't deal with it. Maybe they didn't want to deal with it. Who knows? Um, so that's the kind of situation where, uh, like, that's what's triggered all this deforestation. But most of it has already happened now. Like, they don't have any forests left to deforest. So I'm not sure how the, the current laws are going to apply to them. Some place like Indonesia, which is still sort of actively deforesting, partly for cacao, I think it'll it'll work better there. But I'm not sure how it's going to work in Africa. So this issue of when the deforestation happened comes up over and over and over again because, of course, we deforested huge swaths of the United States and deprairied a whole lot more. Exactly. And so now we're telling other places not to do exactly what we did. Totally. Like my my apple trees are coming from deforested areas. It just happened 400 years ago. <laughs> exactly. But 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 that does. I mean, we kind of laugh about it, but it does suggest that you know what we ought to be. You know, this whole opportunity opportunity cost question that Tamar and I are always getting at, um, that, you know, it sounds like particularly if it's, if it's low yield, um, that cacao may have an opportunity cost, even when it's, when it's planted on, on non, you know, non recently deforested, deforested land. Um, but I think you had mentioned that, that it grows in the shade. And I, I think I had heard that there's this possibility that, you know, you, if you can grow it sort of intermixed and presumably, you know, you have a podcast about, about, you know, wild chocolate, this idea that if, if you can mix it in with existing forests and it can still grow, that presumably it's like, I don't know, it's kind of like growing a winter cover crop that actually is a crop, right? It's like you don't need extra land for it. Exactly, and, uh, yeah. And that, that could be an exciting climate win as well as, uh, you know, money for people who are growing it. So I didn't know that there was wild chocolate. And then I started listening to your podcast. So tell us about wild chocolate and how it's different. Yeah, so this is, the, the funny thing about cacao is it's pure evil, but then it's also potentially like the holy grail of sustainable agroforestry. Um, and it's all in the uh, the process and the philosophy. So yeah, so um, like I said, cacao is native to the Amazon. Um, it was industrialized hundreds of years ago um, by the Europeans. Um, they kind of piggybacked onto the, like the sugar cane plantations that they already had in Brazil and the Caribbean. Um, and then- moved it over to Africa and forgot all the fact that it had ever been a wild plant in the rainforest. And pretty much everybody did. But the cacao tree itself will um, will live basically forever. It's kind of immortal. It's almost like a grove of aspens or something where trunks, individual trunks will die, but then they'll re-sprout. So the organism can go thousands of years so in, in its natural shady rainforest environment. So the trees just sort of hung out there and didn't care that they'd been forgotten about. In fact, probably preferred it that way. Um, but then um, starting maybe 20 years ago, people uh, started sort of rediscovering these wild trees. And it's funny, one of the guys I focus on the, in the podcast literally had to like convince people in the industry that he wasn't making it up, that there was such a thing as wild chocolate. Because this is how long, it's kind of like if you said, oh yeah, here, like wild tomatoes rediscovered or, or wild corn. Um, but in this case, not only was it the original, but in a way chocolate wasn't domesticated that much. 
the original wild cacao actually turned out to make more delicious chocolate than the stuff that we'd been using for hundreds of years. That's like the reverse of every crop we've domesticated that, you know, or most, not not every crop, but most crops that we've domesticated. We've taken these things that aren't like, I think blueberries are, are an outlier, but like we've taken these crops that are kind of delicious. <laughs> or have, or have a, like a seed of deliciousness in them, maybe. Yeah. Right. And, and then we've turned them into these things by, you know, we bred out like the polyphenols and the things that give them bitterness uh, flavors. Yeah. But cacao is the exception, huh? It's a total outlier where we introduced bitterness and astringency to this thing that didn't have, because the Mayan Aztec, they didn't add any sugar to their their chocolate. They drank it straight up. Um, and you know, and maybe they could take a little more bitterness than we could, but they weren't they weren't crazy. But like like they they liked you know a pleasant drink, and uh, they n- never felt the need to add sugar to it. Um, if yeah, the the original was really good, and they probably you know they probably made it a little better um, through selective breeding. Anyway, so th- this, these wild trees were discovered that made totally delicious chocolate, and obviously had a really great story in terms of making it an interesting product. So a few dreamers space started trying to actually make chocolate out of these, these wild uh, beans and, and market it as, um, as, a new, as an interesting chocolate. And they've, they've succeeded, and now it's picked up. And not just the wild ones, but also heirloom varieties that had sort of been forgotten in the rainforest for hundreds of years that date back to the Maya or... Uh, other indigenous groups that used it. Um, So these are all being rediscovered and you're getting all these different flavors that people didn't know were part of the deal with chocolate. But are they trying to domesticate them at all or is this only the wild ones that happen to live in the Amazon right now? There's, yeah, they don't, you don't really need to domesticate them in a sense. Like, and that's the interest here is that they grow in the shade. They love shade. Um, This this guy in Belize who, who we should definitely talk about who's kind of, um, pushing the sort of conservation sustainability part of it the farthest. Um, he's discovered uh, his uh, wild cacao that he has in Belize, it, it likes 90% shade, which is crazy. Nothing, no crop that I know of will grow with 90% shade. No, nothing. If you give it 70% shade, 60%, it's very unhappy. It's like, get me out of the sun. So Right, you can grow Pachysandra, you know. Like- <laughs> yeah, right. So you have to have a forest over this thing. Um, in order to grow it. So that makes it a really interesting candidate for both preserving existing forest and for uh, restoring forest, for growing new forest. Right. As, as It could be a sort of like kind of a accompaniment to afforestation projects, right? Like, you know, you're going to, you're going to plant your, plant your, reforest the, an area. And then by the way, you're also going to have a, a cash crop in there. Um, could you talk about the, the scale? Cause I have to admit when we first, when Tamar and I we were going to do this chocolate thing, I kind of looked at it and it's like, oh, obviously chocolate's so tiny. And, and it turns out it's only 2% of, you know, in tonnage of what we, of the meat we eat. But that's a lot. That's way more than I expected. Like, you think of how much chocolate it takes to make, like, a, you know, the center of a plate, right? I mean, so we eat a lot of chocolate. Presumably, um, I would think that the wild portion is still a very small portion of that portion, right? Oh, yeah. Well, so the, um, the, the cacao, globally, it's like 5 million tons a year. That's a lot of chocolate, um, considering – one acre, you might only produce, you know, 200 kilos or something. So yeah, like 5 million tons. That's crazy. Yeah. and it, Yeah. It, I mean, we only do 300 million tons of, of meat, right? And, I mean, which is a lot, but, yeah, that's interesting. but oh my God, yeah. 5 million tons of cacao, that's, it's up there. And it's like $180 billion industry chocolate, you know, because then, then <laughs> there's all these add-ins. So it's like, it's a big, it's a big market. Um, and yeah, the wild infinitesimal. <laughs> <laughs> like Bolivia is has the most established wild cacao. I don't know if you can even call it an industry, cottage industry. Um, the whole country of Bolivia might be able to do like three hundred tons, <laughs> like very very small. So it's like a rounding error in the. It's a rounding error. It's a rounding error. 
It, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, Tamar and I have talked and you, she knows I have an obsession with Pangamia, which is my, uh, you know, my miracle tree that's going to gonna save the world. And it's also, you know, it's a, a tree crop, but it grows wild in India. And so what they've, they've done is, uh, and in India, everybody, no matter how poor you have, you have a phone with a digit, you know, you can use digital, yeah. a digital currency and they're paying rural peasants to pick wild pangamia seeds. Um, is is that a kind of model that could could work for cacao? Or is it the sort of thing where it really does need to be planted and uh and Yeah, no, it doesn't need to be planted. That's and that's um the people who are doing the truly wild stuff, that's what they're interested in. And that's what I was a part of when I was down there. So um I I'm down in Bolivia, middle of nowhere takes and forget how long it takes to get there, but it's a long time over a lot of bad roads. Um, but then you, you're in this environment where people, it's very, very simple conditions, probably haven't changed much in a few hundred years. Um, and the people have always had the tradition of walking into what they call these uh, chocolatales, which just basically means chocolate forests. And uh, like once a year they go in, um, it's kind of like an extended camping trip, and they harvest the pods and open up the pods and process the beans and dry the beans and come out with the beans. Um, so they're literally just in the rainforest uh, gathering the beans and then leaving. Um, there's zero management of the trees. The trees take care of themselves. Um, so there's, in a sense, zero or close to zero impact. You know, there's like just little foot trails and now, um, you know, like motorbike trails um, into these chocolatales. And then the beans come out and there are traders who buy the beans and sort of get them to the nearest city. Uh, then they, you know, they get transported from there. Um, and that model is now being picked up in Brazil as well. Where a woman I work with, she goes to different river systems and works with whatever indigenous group is there um, to, col- to teach them to what to do with the pods and the seeds once you get them. Because cacao, you know, in these wet, wet moist environments, it'll rot pretty quickly if you don't deal with it right. So as soon as you pick it, you have to open up the pods, ferment the seeds to sort of create the precursors to the chocolate flavors, and then dry them. And once they're stabilized, then you're good. But that's hard to do in the Amazon. I mean, it's hard enough to do in my kitchen. I've had too many fermentation projects go <laughs> go sour, excuse the expression, because you have to have the conditions just right. How hard is that to do? Super hard. And that's why most of the chocolate on earth, or that's one of the big reasons most of the chocolate on earth doesn't taste very good, is it has not been properly fermented. Um, like the Maya would be horrified if they saw what we were doing. Like like in Africa, nobody who's growing chocolate has time to like take the extra two weeks for perfect fermentation to create this artisanal level chocolate, right? They're just trying to get paid. So they don't, they skip the fermentation entirely. They just get the beans out of the pods and get them dry pretty much as quick as they possibly can. And that's when you get that like terrible bitterness and astringency. Um, and then just the Hershey guys shove in lots of sugar, and so it's all, you know, it just tastes fine, right? That's, so, yeah. like, no one ever cared. That's a commodity, right? Like, in the 1900s, when, when the system was established, nobody was going to pay you more because your chocolate tasted a little bit better. It was, yeah, it was just being mixed with tons of sugar and who knows what else. And still is, mostly. So, yeah, like, good business decisions were made. Bad, you know, bad human and eco- ecological decisions, but... Good business decisions led to, to bad things, basically. Um, but, but yeah, so in these r- super remote places like Brazil, Bolivia, um, you need a little bit of infrastructure. So you're not the rain isn't going to ruin your crop. Um, and you need a little bit of knowledge. And then you need to be able to get it to, you know, a city somewhere eventually. Um, so those are the challenges. And it is very challenging. All right. So this show focuses on climate. And so is it, reasonable to think that one of the ways this chocolate could be a climate plus is that it gives people a way to make a living from the forest without chopping it down? Exactly. Yes. So the people in these areas, their their options for, for cash, for any sort of like basic income are really limited. It's traditionally been fishing or um, gathering other uh, forest products. And so what that generally gives way to is ranching often where there's more money right. in, uh, you burning down the forest, you slash and burn agriculture. Um, and then you bring, cattle. yeah. And then you bring in your cat, 
cows. And and fishing is is going down in many parts of the Amazon as well. So suddenly they have they need to find Plan B, uh, and they have this cacao growing wild, which they haven't even generally been paying any attention to. It was just sort of like another tree that was there. But now uh, various nonprofit groups in the Amazon are realizing that this is the like sort of like the stopgap that can provide income and keep the forest from just being like turned into pasture. At what kind of scale? Depends on the place. It, it, where In places where you have this wild chocolate, um, it can make the difference. But those places, you got you to gotta pick and choose. It tends to be right along the river systems. Uh, cacao is like a, it grows along the gallery forests. It sort of likes that annual flooding that it gets from the rivers. So it's, in certain villages and areas, it can be, um, it can be big for them. But in only certain places. It's not going to save the whole rainforest because it doesn't exist. In, you Damn. Know, like, but the demand for those for that cacao is virtually infinite, right? I mean, when compared to the, the scale at which they can do this. So it really does seem like it's a question of harnessing climate finance, whether that's in the form of governments or in the form of these carbon markets that we always say are the kind of, you know, the worst solution except for all the others. <laughs> yeah. um, some way to get basically tons of money into these areas to make it in people's best interest to keep the forest up rather than down. Um, and this seems like a potentially really attractive way to do that that would kind of work for on the demand side and also on the supply side. And right now it's just being done on a purely, you know, uh, like mercantile basis. Like they're literally just trying to fund it by selling the chocolate bars eventually. Right. So, but yeah, so if if like the carbon credits start to creep into it, suddenly it becomes a much bigger deal. And I know um, a bunch of the usual suspects are starting to look at it that way down there. Right. And and you should go, I mean, presumably you could go after some of the unusual pro- suspects, right? You could tell like Hershey, like, hey, <laughs> we have a way that you can offset your emissions or at least, uh, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. how about put some money into this fund um, for Bolivia. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Partly it all depends on getting whether eventually consumers are willing to pay that much for a job. That's bar. my next question. <laughs> so you've painted two pictures. We have the evil industrialized deforested chocolate, and then we have the good climate positive wild chocolate. And so to figure out, like, those are the two anchors of the spectrum of chocolate. For starters, what's the price differential? So a basic chocolate bar in the supermarket, it's going to cost you, like, $1 to $2, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, for a, a bar of really, like, the high-level craft chocolate, sustainably f- grown, either wild or just heirloom, um, you're looking at 10 bucks at, at least, you know? So it's an order of magnitude. It is an order of magnitude. Yeah, literally. Okay. Well, then, and again, I mean, we're talking about such a difference that it probably, but uh, but presumably some of that is because of this, you know, this wild problem or that even the heirloom problem. But some of it is because of the lack of a supply chain in the developing world for for this stuff, where you know, basically, you're you're paying for <laughs> right, you know, for what they don't have. Totally. And and if you look at one of the big players, um, there's not that much chocolate in a lot of their products. So, you know, even if you're doubling the co- their cost of their cacao, it's not actually going to change the the um, unit cost that much, you know. Okay, so we got the evil industrial chocolate. We have the crazy interesting wild chocolate. Where is the potential to try and use the wild chocolate to fill in a kind of a spectrum of chocolate. So, so the the industrialized chocolate isn't the only mainstream choice. And you know, Mike and I talked beforehand, and Mike mentioned, and you said in the podcast about, and you said here that okay, a, a crop that grows in shade should be just this huge climate win. But it's not going to be the huge climate win that we would love it to be if it just stays in the rainforest. I mean, we want what's there to stay in the rainforest. But if we can we take this idea of a tree that grows in shade and use it for intercropping with like 
Brazil nuts or something else that grows in similar kinds of conditions? Or can we breed shade tolerance back in, seeing that we bred it out? Um, what can we do now that we have you know, knowledge of this and we're collecting knowledge of this? How can we turn that into more of a scalable solution? Um, yeah, and it's all there. Um, and, and that is happening. Um, and it's... Uh, it's still, a, it's a small movement, but it, it really is changing. Um, and it doesn't have to be truly wild chocolate. Like, that's what I focus on in the podcast because it's, you know, it's an adventure story. It's a treasure hunt. So it's, it's a great story, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's just so unlikely. But but there's also lots of heirloom varieties of cacao and, and other even non-heirloom varieties that have pretty good flavor um, that prefer, prefer the shade. There's only a handful of varieties that like the sun. Those are the, the you know, the weirdos. Um, so th- th- everything's there for it to be grown as more of a shade crop. And that's happening, especially in the Americas. Um, but even in Africa, it's starting. There's a few cooperatives in Africa that are, you know, of course they're fair trade certified, but they're also, um, uh, they're, they're just, they're community, uh, operations that are doing all the things you, you want to see done. It's a tiny, tiny scale, but growing because obviously everybody wants to, you know, that's where everyone wants to get their uh, cacao. Like, and and there's examples. Like, are you guys familiar with Tony's Chocolate Lonely? Have you come across that in Whole Foods or anywhere? I have not. I, it's chocolate, not my thing. All right, of course, yeah. All right, so Tony's Tony's is a Dutch company that that set out like 20 years ago. Their express purpose was to get uh, child labor out of the chocolate industry. So Tony's, and, and they've grown, they're kind of like the Ben and Jerry's of chocolate in a sense. Like their packaging is very much that fun, funky Ben and Jerry style. Uh, and Tony's buys from seven uh, co-ops in Africa. And the, Tony's is like, I don't know, they're like, a, I think they're like a $20 million company now. Uh, but they, uh, so they are managing to sell a lot of chocolate at a fairly cheap price. Um, like I think one of the, the, their bars are huge and they're like four bucks. I don't know how they do it, frankly. So buying all their all their chocolate from these seven cooperatives. But uh, this is kind of an example of how complicated it is. Tony's was just dropped from an important list of slave-free chocolate companies, quite controversially, um, because they had to admit that they couldn't be certain that all, all of their cacao was slave-free because part of the, the way that they've managed to um, keep their prices down is by having Barry Calibo, the giant, largest chocolate maker in the world, make all of their chocolate for them. So Tony's is paying the, you know, the cooperatives in Africa, but Tony's isn't involved in the making process at all. Like all that, all those beans go to Barry Calibo and are turned into chocolate in the exact same facility that is making all of the slave full chocolate. It's almost like they're more of a logistics company than a chocolate company, right? And that's true for every, if you go to Whole Foods, and this is actually in the, one of our podcasts, I have it, this expert walk me through every brand in the Whole Foods. They're all being made in like the same two factories. Okay, so this this raises a question that comes up over and over and over again. So all of these companies want to be able to produce like slave-free, carbon-neutral, climate-friendly products, but consumers are extremely price-sensitive, so they're always trying to do this while keeping prices down, and bullshit ensues. So are there brands or certifications that consumers can actually trust or is it all just a cesspool like it is in other kinds of fair trade certifications? The big stamps of approval, all, it seems to be the same cesspool that it is in, in every other one. But so, yeah, you so you go, then you opt, choose to opt out and you look for the small guys. One of the big movements in chocolate, which is true in other areas too, has been, you know, once fair trade was clearly not enough, um, they've turned to what they call direct trade, where a chocolate maker will be buying their beans directly from uh, a producer. Uh, and then with that kind of a relationship, you can you you could guarantee a lot more. Um, and uh, one of the people I focus on in the podcast, a woman named Emily Stone, 
started a company called Uncommon Cacao, which focuses on transparent trade. Um, they buy from various small farm farmers uh, in uh, mostly in Latin America and sell to the make the U.S. craft chocolate uh, industry. Um, and they not only do they like show every every step of their supply chain, but they've actually published the prices they pay for every step and are paid for every step in the supply chain because by doing so, then it puts pressure on other people to. Uh, Every farmer knows what everyone else is getting paid. And then how much more does that cost a consumer at the retail level than the standard issue industrial chocolate? Well, those, well yeah, probably 10 bucks and up. Those are the, those are the beans that are... Um, so here's the... Th- I mean, we get into this all the time. And okay, look, I want to be clear. I have farmed oysters for a decade. I'm in favor of luxury products for rich people. I think that they can do a lot of changing. But if if we're faced with this landscape where we have this one tiny sliver of the um, the market that's really expensive and only for for luxury buyers, and the rest of it basically stays the same. I mean, where's the future for mass market climate friendly foods in a world where most people are poor? Right. I I think maybe you can't put all those you can't put all those variables together. Something has to change. I mean, any 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 expensive product you 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 get to that right? Like like the questions lead you to, like, is there a place for expensive products, or should all products be expensive? And then meaning all people should be able to afford expensive products. And then, I mean, you know, that's a different, that's a different planet in a, in a sense. Right. And I would just jump in tomorrow and point out, like, remember, this is part of the idea of climate finance, right? And, right. and the reason that we don't, we don't think of it much because there's been it's been so paltry, right? Like there's a big deal when Norway provides a billion dollars to Brazil and then they cut off the billion dollars because Bolsonaro is bad and now they're going to get the billion dollars a year back when what they really need is a hundred billion dollars. Like we need like a much larger scale for climate finance. But the idea is to sort of offset some of these, you know, unaccounted for externalities um, that, you know, presumably a carbon market would would help with as well and and level the playing field between, you know, the things that are bad, whether for climate reasons or for exploitation reasons or even for health reasons. Um, there are ways they can use public policy and even the private markets to offset some of those gaps. Though obviously when we're talking about an order of magnitude difference, you know, that's going to be hard to make up. But again, again, this is like, there's a lot of chocolate. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize just how much there was. And rich people are going to eat some of it. You know, perfect is not on the menu. But, you know, my mantra is that better is better than worse. And it seems like there is, like, <laughs> partly because this stuff is so shitty. <laughs> like, there's a, there's a lot of room for better, um, whether it's, you know, tweaking the way the stuff is grown, um, rewarding the people who grow it better, um, refusing to deal with the people who grow it in the worst way. There just seems like a, a lot of room for improvement. And I think some of that's going to happen. I think these cooperatives in Africa are actually the key. They're the little seeds that are going to grow. And more and more people are going to want that style of chocolate, which is, because it's Africa, it's not that expensive. It's not that much more. But it's much better than the the standard option. So I think it is going to grow. So you see improvement and you see a path to continued improvement in chocolate as a whole? For sure. I mean, there's enough pressure now um, through fair trade. And, and actually, even the, the countries themselves are, are trying to put a premium on what they're paid, which th- in theory like goes to the farmers. But there's some rumors that some of it doesn't make it to the farmers. But um, but yeah, um, th- there's there's a lot of – there's increasing awareness and increasing pressure. Um, and there hasn't been a way to change the giant system. But as always happens – Giant systems don't change, but they get like, you know, the the yin starts to grow in the yang. So you're seeing these little little cooperatives that are doing things differently and are being supported by bean to bar chocolate makers in the U.S. Consumers they learned some lessons. They've learned to, I mean, 
maybe again, don't, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't even let the good be the enemy of the half ass. But right, consumers right. learn to look for that fair trade, that logo, or and for other signs. They, they learned that there was a problem with chocolate, and they had to try to like right. try to find the the one that was signaling that it was better. Um, so th- there is um, there's some energy there. Before we let you go, can we can you give our listeners who are who care about this stuff, not even just the climate stuff, but the uh, you know the exploitation stuff as well? Like, what would be your advice in terms of what they can do when as consumers, and also what they could do as citizens in terms of how how you fix this? Yeah, so support the uh, the farmers and the companies that are um, caring about this and doing it. And the best way to do that is actually this is kind of fun. Um, a few years ago, the some people in the fine chocolate industry and the USDA of all people teamed up to create the Heirloom Cacao Preservation Fund. So um, they look at different cacaos um, across the world, but mostly in the Americas. Find the ones that have incredible flavor and that have actual heirloom cultural significance and that are grown sustainably, and they basically put their stamp of approval on those, and then help. And they actually help uh, create a market for those. They're not doing that great a job, I guess, in that most people still don't know about them. But it's um, it's a really cool program. It's kind of like what you wish fair trade was um, on a micro level and on kind of a, a slightly like snooty foodie level. But anyway, so the Heirloom Cacao Preservation Fund is the name of that. And you they have their own website you can go to. But there's also a, a great chocolate importer called Caputo's, C-A-P-U-T-O-S, um, that is that cares a lot about this stuff. And they actually have supported a lot of these initiatives. And you go to their website, it's, you know, shop online, and they actually have a whole Heirloom Cacao Preservation Fund listing of the chocolates that they sell that are part of this uh, organization. Just a, a quick question. Now, I, I know that, uh, so like Mars, the Mars Company, which is the biggest in this in this space, they're also out there in a big way about how climate conscious they are. And, uh, and you know, I know they do, they do a lot of regenerative agriculture stuff there. You always see their name. Um, but when it comes to chocolate, is it just bogus? Are they just as, as bad as everybody else? They could be doing more. Um, what's interesting about Mars is they're privately owned, right? So right. like the Hershey's of the world um, or the Cargill's, like they're publicly traded. So they're somewhat hamstrung in you know, what they can, in terms of like doing smart long-term things. Uh, but Mars, Mars could just say like, we're going to pay twice as much for our chocolate and uh, require all these things. And then would they get crushed in the market because their, their chocolate would be more expensive or would everyone else have to then follow suit, you know? Um, so they have, uh, they've, they've done some small good things, but man, they should all be doing way more than they are. Well, after listening to several episodes of the podcast, I really wanted to do this uh, episode of Climavores in person because I want to taste those things. And I'm not even a big chocolate lover, but the way that you describe it as as being markedly different from the chocolate that we're used to really made, but I mean, we need like smell of vision, taste of vision, but we don't have that. Well, I think, you, yeah, you'll understand why you are, uh, why you weren't a chocolate lover um, when you taste it. But I have to confess, I was not the biggest chocolate lover either. I really, it, it's a different experience. Um, and I, I also found that drinking chocolate, like using, making a proper Mayan style drinking chocolate was like a game changer for me. And you know, it's funny how many people who are involved in the space have sort of, um, like confess to me with embarrassment that they're not big chocolate lovers either. <laughs> well, Rowan, I hope you'll I hope you'll get my address to these uh, wild cacao collectors and uh, and make sure that you know I can really sample whether their their claims are accurate. Yes, that would be very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Rowan, thank you so much for being with us today. This was like chocolate was a subject that neither Mike nor I had had knew a lot about that we hadn't really dug into. So it was great having the impetus to do it and having you here to fill in all the blanks and talk about it from soup to nuts. So thank you. We we really appreciate it. You're you're great, and we ho- we hope you'll help us do more service journalism in the in the future <laughs> when it comes to chocolate. Well, well, thanks. I really appreciate being here. Mm-hmm. 
Climavores is a production of Postscript Media, and we want to know what you're thinking, although right now I know that you're thinking about chocolate. But give us a call. We're at 508-377-3449 or email us at climavores at postscriptaudio.com. Your questions become part of some of the most fun episodes we do, the mailbag episodes. The show is hosted by me, Tamar Haspel. And me, Michael Grunwald. Executive producers are Scott Clavenna and Stephen Lacey. Senior editor is Ann Bailey. The producers are Dalvin Abawaje and Daniel Waldorf. Mixing is by Sean Marquin and Roy Campanella. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures, a venture capital firm focused on climate solutions across energy, food, agriculture, transportation, logistics, and advanced materials. And you know the drill. If you like us, please tell people, spread the word, give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're also streaming on Amazon Music. And please, if you think you know somebody who would like us, send them a link. And come back next week when we'll talk about something else delicious. Delicious.